Hello, welcome to the IUN presentation, Dynamic Container Gardens. I'm Leslie Kaiser, garden coordinator and a moderator for this session. Our presenter this afternoon is Lynn Barbie. Lynn is a horticulturist and master gardener and has worked in the retail garden industry for over 25 years, 21 years at the South Lake Home Depot. She loves helping people grow things. Landscape design is her favorite topic, especially woody plants and flowering shrubs. She's a big fan of foliage and is always looking for four season interest in the garden. She teaches business classes for Ivy Tech. So with two jobs, she's always on the lookout for the easy way to do things. Lynn, we're excited to have you with us. First of all, I wanna, uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining me today. I hope this is, turns out to be worth your time. Um, you might wonder about the term dynamic container gardens. I refer to that as uh, just something changing all the time changing. So this is a, actually a foliage basket. I think it's pretty, even though there are no flowers in it. Am I? Okay. So this is, this looks like a, a really pretty container. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about all seasons. This looks like a fall container over here. So let's start with basics, like choosing the style of pot. I don't know about you, but that top left corner um, picture with the tires is not really something I would put in my front yard, but it does look like a lot of fun. And that might be something for kids. Um, that top middle container is something that um, my friend of mine and I chose for our, in front of our church landscaping. So you might want to think of like what your house looks like, where you're using your container, um, but also think about the, the weather for your container. We'll talk about that in a little while too. Um, think about scale. This is uh, in front of Baker Square. I took this picture a few years ago. I love the combination of plants for one thing, but look how big those are. And um, think about in, a, in front of a commercial landscape, in front of a big home, you, you need big landscaping and you need, need big containers as well. Also big containers like that um, will hold more soil and will not have to be watered near as often. This is um, in Crown Point. I've been meaning to find out how they water those things. I know that commercial places um, will often have a tank that you put on the back of a truck. So maybe that's what they do, um, drive around with a truck and, um, and water plants. Um, I've heard that some municipalities require um, self-watering pots uh, just to make things easier like that. And of course you would wanna choose plants that don't require a lot of care and fussing. Um, if you don't have big pots, you can group pots together to make a bigger impact. It's kind of nice sometimes to have a repeating color like that one or this one here, a repeating theme, all blue pots um, or repetition of foliage color, foliage uh, or the same different plants. Now this one does have tulips in it. We'll talk a bit more about putting things in pots for winter and choice of winter pots. Um, we'll talk about it right now. Um, some pots, and I would say, I can't say for sure which ones are, would be winter proof or all weather proof. Uh, clay is not, clay is not terracotta. Um, water gets into the pot in the, because it's a porous, porous product. Um, water gets in there either through the wet soil or through humidity in the air. And during winter, it freezes. And then as it thaws, it breaks the pot apart, that's called spalling. So you look for uh, containers that specifically say that they are weatherproof. You don't need to fill, I got a pot this size actually, that tall uh, cylindrical pot. Um, we only filled the top foot and a half maybe of soil. Uh, you don't need to fill that much. When you think about containers, they're, they're only gonna have maybe a foot maybe even a foot and a half at most of uh, soil that they need to, the bigger the pot and the more plants you put in there, obviously the more soil you will need, um, but you don't need to fill the entire pot. You can put things like um, pop cans in the bottom, styrofoam. I wouldn't use the styrofoam peanuts necessarily. I've seen those pop out. You could put those in a plastic bag and tie the bag up and put those in the bottom. Um, some people are concerned about soil coming out of the bottom, in which case you could put a coffee filter or just a piece of newspaper along the bottom. I've never seen that to be a, much of a problem. 
Um, but uh, you could put, what else? You could put pine cones in the bottom, pine mulch, pine bark. And uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of this a type of, this is a raised bed garden style um, called hugel culture. And in, in traditional hugel culture, they just pile logs and branches and stuff on top of each other like that. But you could use those same concepts in a raised bed like that, or you could use it in a pot. Um, they refer to that as a hugel pot. So um, if, especially if you have something like big chunks of logs in there, uh, something that's already dried out, um, put that in the bottom of your pot. That When that actually gets wet, it'll actually hold moisture in, which is a big plus. Um, I have never had a hugel or a hugel culture raised bed garden. I just don't have need for that or desire to build one in my yard at this point. Um, but they say that the that you only need to water a few times a year if you have a raised bed hugel culture raised bed thing. In a pot like this, it's definitely going to help with maintaining moisture and save on soil. Soil gets very expensive after a while. Um, People often ask, um, like I work in the garden center, right? People often ask, or even yesterday, I talked to a few people out of buying garden soil for their containers or out of putting potting soil in the ground. You'll see the bags are labeled for garden soil. It'll be labeled in ground use. Um, garden soil is heavier. It has, um, it has stuff in it that, uh, well, the potting soil has vermiculite, perlite, sphagnum moss. There is actually no soil at all in potting soil or potting mix. That's why it's referred to as potting mix most of the time. Um, there is no soil in there and it's a lot lighter weight. Um, in, in the ground, you have earthworms and other activity that could help aerate your soil, but in a pot, you don't have that. You'll see soils labeled moisture control, and I've heard differing opinions. I've used it myself. I don't know if there's a big difference. Uh, maybe when we get to the question and answer period, uh, some, some people would like to weigh in on that. You're gonna be watering containers often anyway. Um, pretty much every day, I would say, unless it rains, you need to water uh, containers. Anything in a container is gonna dry out faster than, it, than if those plants were in the ground. If they're hanging baskets, they're gonna dry out even more. As many hundreds or thousands of hanging baskets that we sell in the spring, uh, take a look around your neighborhood and see how many of them are still there in people's yards. Uh, even, even in July, they need to be watered all the time. And um, something else I'd like to get feedback on at some point, because some people uh, talk about using um, baby diapers. We'll talk about that in a little while. That's coming up on the other side. By the way, just a caveat. One of the hardest things for me in writing research papers in college and grad school was getting my thoughts in order. <laughs> and in a PowerPoint, it's even harder when you're sliding those things around. So don't be surprised if I co cover something again. Okay, what's in potting mix? Like I said, it's a combination of things, but no soil. There'll be a lot of sphagnum moss in there. Sphagnum moss, if you have ever, ever used those compressed bales, it sucks up a lot of water, a lot of water. It'll be compressed and in potting mix, it's moistened, but if you let it sit around too long, uh, your potting mix will get dried out often uh, or dried out more easily too. Uh, vermiculite and perlite are in there, those little white specks or gray specks in there um, for, for aeration. And, um, and a lot of potting soils have fertilizer added to it. Now it might say three months worth or six months worth, but that is a slow release fertilizer and is always dependent on how much, how often you're watering, how much you're watering and that kind of thing because it'll leach out of that um, potting mix more quickly. Wish I had a better picture of this, but basically please fill up your pot if you're using it from year to year. Uh, there's nothing more pitiful than seeing plants try to stick their noses out of the soil. Um, and people have asked too about uh, reusing potting soil. I, I use it, I reuse potting soil. Um, sometimes I'll add, because you do have to add, as it as that sphagnum moss and other whatever else is in there is decomposing, that's why the soil level goes down. It starts to compact. And um, so you could certainly just add more potting soil on the top. You can mix in potting soil with the top eight inches or whatever, 10 inches that you have. 
um, and then you know top it off with good stuff if you want to do that. But it'll your plants will look nicer if you cover up. Uh, you still want to leave maybe an inch or so. Um, and, and of course, depending on the style of the pot, like the way this one has a rim, you don't want to see the inside of that uh, inside of that corner. You might have heard of uh, the Proven Winners recipe or format, I guess, what they call thrillers, uh, spillers, and fillers. And you can see them highlighted in this picture. Thrillers would be tall, upright plants, something that gives um, you know, dramatic interest up here. Fillers are the things that fill in in the middle. And then the spillers, the plants that hang over. I wanted to include a family portrait of, I don't know what, what movie is that from, a real silly picture, but you think about a family portrait. Usually there's dad and then there's mom. She's a little shorter most of the time. And then there's kids sitting down here. And that's just an artistic design that uh, the triangular format that people have used for years for, for, for artwork. Um, when you choose your plants, look for things that have similar sun requirements and similar watering requirements. Now, a lot of times plants, uh, and there's always the question, will this do well in the shade? Will, the, will this, or how much shade or how much sun is enough or not too much? I have seen petunias, which are considered full sun loving plants. I've seen them doing well in part shade. Um, I think full sun is considered six hours a day. But even if you have shade, it doesn't necessarily mean it's shade just because there's something covering it, like a canopy. If it is bright enough to read a book out there or, or look at your phone, um, it's still considered to, to be a bright shade. And, and there is no black and white line that at this point your plant is going to die. Um, often plants that don't get as much sun as they need, you might see longer spaces between the leaves uh, the, the leaves might be smaller um, or even larger to catch more light, but um, unless you have really, really deep shade, I wouldn't worry too much about your plants. Give it a shot. Um, vary the texture and color. Look at the huge leaves on that calocasia. And then we've got, a, it looks like a coleus with really fine leaves back there. Um, green is a color, by the way. I love green. Uh, and I love the different shades of green, You've got that chartreuse lime green color on the sweet potato vine. Um, and that it's a beautiful accent. Look at that, no flowers at all, right? No flowers at all. And just a plug for landscaping too. Um, in a landscape, shrubs and perennials only bloom for a short time. Anything that comes back year after year only blooms for a few weeks. So you really need to focus on foliage. Uh, in a container garden, you pretty much want flowers anyway, right? You could even put perennials and small shrubs in a container with cautions. If um, like the heucheras in that top left photo, uh, the heucheras really like cooler weather. They don't mind it. I should say they don't mind cooler weather. And so you could plant those earlier or keep them later into the fall. Um, and then the false cypress on the bottom right, um, an evergreen, okay? but. So they like cooler weather, they can handle the cooler weather, but if you have a small pot, there's not as much insulation around there um, to keep the roots uh, over winter. So if you have a really big pot, you could keep an evergreen in there all winter long, but you have to think that um, above ground, look for plants that can handle weather two zones colder. We'll get into, the, into zones in one of these slides here. Um, we are in zone five, and the zone numbers start at the top of the country and go down. So if you get a plant that can handle zone three, um, it's, going, it's going to be able to handle colder weather above ground. I hope, I hope I'm making sense over there, okay? And um, so let's talk a little, we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a little while too. Um, when it comes to fertilizer, and I mentioned that potting soil, if it has fertilizer in it, uh, because you're going to be watering every day or almost every day, you're going to go through your fertilizer. Now, this is not a plug for miracle Grow. I've just used these as an example of what the NPK, you'll see the three numbers on fertilizer. Um, this is the all-purpose plant food. It has 24% nitrogen, 8% phosphorus, and 16% potassium. Uh, N is for the nitrogen, P and PK. Uh, K because 
we can't use P twice. It's just a chem chemist thing. You'll have to talk to the chemists about that. Um, but if you look at any fertilizer for flowers, you'll see a higher middle number. This is miracle Grow Bloom Booster. It's 153015 because that middle number helps with the growth of flowers and uh, blooms in general. So things like um, vegetables that you want to produce fruit have to start with flowers. If you over fertilize or use two different kinds of fertilizer, there's a good chance you'll get more too much nitrogen and you'll have beautiful vines without flowers or lots of foliage without flowers. Okay, now this 105210, I put that in there because I don't know if you could still find Miracle Grow with that formulation the formula. Uh, some places don't want you to use too much phosphorus, and I suspect that that's why they reduced it. This is the 153015 is what I see at our store now. Um, it's possible they sell it elsewhere, 105210. Uh, but just so just remember, the first number is nitrogen for foliage growth but the middle number is um, for flowering growth. Last number, by the way, is for all around plant health and, um, and root development. Okay, dead heading. I always say this is the, the yeah, well, the, the birds and the bees part of plants. Um, a flower's job in life is to produce flower. A plant's job in life is to produce flowers. So this geranium, for example, after the flowers are gone, if you snip it right at the base of the stem, don't leave the stem hanging because it'll just dry out and look ugly. If you cut off that flower, the plant will produce more flowers. Now there are some flowers, or and if you don't, it'll eventually stop blooming. A geranium, for example, it will just stop blooming and just won't. Well, and then what you want is flowers, right? Um, there are some annuals that you don't have to worry about. Um, Victoria blue salvia comes to mind, impatience. A lot of those you don't have to worry about deadheading. So make sure you know the, the culture or the, the, the likes and dislikes or whatever I wanna say of the flowers that you're planting. Um, watering, okay, here's where we're gonna talk again about the baby diapers. So hold your thoughts for later. I think we'll talk about that later. Um, some people use baby diapers in the bottom of a pot they say that holds moisture. Um, I'm curious to know, I've never tried it, don't have any needs for need for diapers at my house, uh, but when it comes to the moisture control soil and the water crystals they used to sell, I haven't seen those in a while, water crystals in a bag that you can add to soil. And what I suspect or what I have heard, what my experience has been, that those things can sometimes, if the soil dries out, it actually sucks moisture away from your, the roots of your plant, which kind of defeats the purpose. You still have to water every day. And if you don't water every day, this, the, the crystals and that, the crystals in the moisture control can very possibly suck the, the water that's in the soil away from the plants. Um, these water globes, I think they're pretty. I don't know how uh, efficient they are because they only hold so much water. Um, the idea being that you fill these up with water and then as the plant needs water down below, uh, the water will automatically come out of the globe and into the water. I have seen, um, or I have actually made those <laughs> where you take a pop bottle, fill it up with water and poke holes in the little lid, turn that upside down there. Not as pretty, but if you're not caring so much about the decor, that, that would work, but again, there's only that much water and it's it's not like it's something that's gonna really be helpful on a vacation. Hydrophobic plants. These plants are afraid of water. Actually, they get resistant to water. Uh, hanging baskets are number one um, victim to that. Uh, the reason is that um, hanging baskets are in potting soil and any potting soil, like we said, has a lot of sphagnum moss in it and Sphagnum moss will really suck up a lot of water, um, but if you let it dry out and those hanging baskets are swinging in the breeze, uh, you know, all day long, um, when the sphagnum moss gets really dry, if you let it go, um, it's really hard to get it wet again. And you could water with your rain wand or whatever, and the water will just fall right off. It'll go right over the top. So what you need to do in that case is to, um, Take the hanging basket down and let it soak for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, maybe even half an hour. I don't think that's going to hurt it too much. 
and uh, and let that sphagnum moss get good and wet. Several years ago, I worked with a guy that used sphagnum moss, that baled sphagnum moss um, as a mulch cover in his garden, which eventually gets kind of dry and crusty, but it keeps things below dry. I don't know that I would want to do that. He's the only one that I know who's ever done that. Um, but when I first used it, I had to put the sphagnum moss in a, in a garbage can and just fill it up with water and it drank so much water. Same thing true is if you buy the, like the pro mixes and those potting soils that come in small bales, make sure you soak that really good first and let it get a lot of water in there because otherwise you're gonna be fighting that hydrophobic plant uh, thing for a long, long time. Um, so let's start talking about some combinations. Uh, like I said, dynamic, I think of changing through the seasons. So here's a, a just a not too unusual uh, combination. Now I see things in here like the coleus and the ferns, which are we consider shade plants. There are a lot of coleus that can handle more sun. And um, so that's just one combination. Again, we're looking at different foliage uh, textures and colors as well as, um, as, as well as some flowers in there. Another coleus uh, sweet potato, it's like um, New Guinea and patients in there. And that foliage off to the side is uh, Japanese forest grass. And, uh, and I like the combination. I love the, I love chartreuse foliage. I love the way it looks with pink, with orange, with red, uh, and really striking like that. Here's another one. Some of these plants, I had to really think about what we've got going here. The Lysimachia, by the way, that trailing green plant, very cold hardy. So you could put that in a container and have it through, I think it's listed for zones two or three. So other than the fact that the weather is gonna be beating it up at that point, it will still remain alive in a container very likely. And again, that depends on what our winter is like. Um, how much, If you remember to water things during the winter, if it's in a pot, and it's on your porch and you, you know, going to try to keep it through the winter, you have to remember to water it just as if it would be getting snow on the ground. You know, think about melting snow now and then. Maybe not every day water, but it would need it periodically. Um, that little tiny flower in the middle is, a, I wonder if that's a proven winner's plant. Um, it's some kind of oxalis or clover. Again, just a foliage accent. The, the orange looks like wishbone flower, Terminia. And uh, again, just beautiful contrast between the orange and the bright green foliage. Very traditional um, pink geraniums and alyssum. That purple plant for accent there is a uh, Trata scantia. It looks like maybe purple night. And here, sweet potato vine is like one of the most common, I would say. Uh, years for years, it was the asparagus fern. Uh, now I see more, more than anything sweet potato vine um, there's the, the, the lime green ones. There's also a dark purple. There are some with different shapes and just very, very pretty. And they can handle, um, and they can handle a lot of tough conditions. Um, we've got caladiums here. Now caladiums are shade plants. Uh, so is the begonia, so is ivy. Um, that little, um, it's like a zebra, trailing, that's a type of Tradescantia, again, like a wandering, we would say wandering Jew, and um, another accent plant in there. A lot of companies, it's not just proven winners, but um, Bigoro has, uh, and of course, that's what I'm familiar with, has um, a lot of filler plants. They usually come in uh, like a cup size, pint size, I guess it would be, and usually run, you know, three or four dollars but those things will fill up a lot of space and, um, and they don't sell those things in six packs or eight packs. Let's see, more coleus and sweet potato vine. And then right here in the middle, this is a heuchera. You can plant perennials in containers. And um, you know, at first you might think, why would I spend that much money on something that's gonna be in a container? But you can, if you plan well, you could put those in your garden at the end of the season. You wanna make sure you put them in the ground um, early enough that they have a chance to settle in. And uh, again, some plants would be would settle in very easily and some might be a little more finicky. When we look at our, our zone map, um, again, there's no black and white lines between things. More cannas, cannas can be really, really striking 
um, height or, or thriller plants. This one is grown specifically for the foliage, I would say. Now the flowers too, but the foliage is beautiful. So in something like a really big pot, that's what they had in that in the middle of that pot that I showed you from Crown Point. Those were cannas in the middle. But even if this is not in bloom, you've got that beautiful foliage over there. More caladiums coming in all different colors. And by the way, both of these are considered tender bulbs. So for the cannas and the caladiums, when they're done at the end of the season, you could dig up the bulbs and save those for next year, um, store them um, um, in a cool, dry place for, for the following year, and you'll have then they'll multiply, you'll have even more. This is Purple Heart Tradescantia. I saw those in our garden center late in the fall. Now, I don't know, um, I didn't look to see what the zone is. I don't know. Um, but I saw it in the fall, so I'm assuming that it's a, and, and, a lot of the trade is scanty as our um, in hardy in our area. So this one might be as well, or at least coal hardy. I'm hoping so since I saw it in the fall. Uh, not everything you see in garden centers is for, for the zone that we you would think. There are a lot of things in there that are, yeah, that should not be sold in our area or you just have to be careful and read the label. This I'm throwing in here just because it's my favorite, um, my favorite uh, annual of all time. You might be familiar with the perennial salvia. This is salvia farinacea, which is an annual. But again, there is no black and white line. So it is a more hardy annual, I would say, in our area. It will last for a long time. And what I, I love the blue spiky flowers. Uh, and it looks pretty with daisy shape, like the little yellow coreopsis there. It looks pretty with pink petunias. Um, Dusty Miller, pink uh, vinca, periwinkle, um, looks good with a lot of flowers. And just recently I bought some, it was called Unplugged So Blue. That's a proven winter's plant, but it's also a salvia farinacea. And so I'm gonna try that this summer. Okay, here's the zone map. So you can see right up in here, we are in zone five, but the zone, if you could get a plant that'll live up all the way into Canada, you know it's gonna be okay in a pot um, uh, um, outside. You just have to remember to water occasionally as though it were snow melting on it, uh, but those plants will be pretty dormant. They, they will be dormant during the winter. Okay. So you're probably familiar with a lot of these. These are plants that will do well in fall. You've seen a lot of these in containers. We think of mums, first of all, mums, uh, but there are some plants that are bearing fruit in the fall, like the little um, ornamental peppers there. Some of these things, if you cannot find them in garden centers and like to start things indoors, you could start those certainly to have them for your fall containers. Uh, there's heuchera on the bottom and real pretty grasses. Millet, uh, a lot of the grasses really turn pretty in the fall and um, we'll get nice seed heads on them. By the way, purple fountain grass, I hate to tell you, is not perennial in our area. I just throw that in because I see so many people buying it and it is not a perennial grass. But um, depending on, I don't remember what the zone is on that offhand, but it could be um, very cold hardy, um, a very cold hardy grass. And uh, the, the cone flowers, there's purple cone flower and um, the sombrero series of cone flower with those beautiful colors. And those things are very hardy. They're uh, perennial in our area. And so um, they would do well. Again, you, you might have to, you would have to put those in the ground at some point, but you'll have flowers lasting for a long time. And if you just want to use them as an annual and not worry about planting them, you still have those nice seed pods for um, added interest. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some fall, just some fall ideas here, okay? Um, this is a fall foliage plant it, or fall container. You can see it's got the traditional mums in it. It's got grasses in it. Um, some Just some twigs in there. It's very possible that some of those are artificial. Nothing wrong with adding some artificial touches to, um, to a container uh, planting. Probably one of the most popular, I would say, for fall and winter gardens, though, is the flowering kale and flowering cabbage. And sometimes when you look at those in the garden center in uh, the early part of the fall, the color is not as nice. The color develops better as the plant, as it gets colder outside. 
Now see that picture on the far right, it's got those tall birch logs for accents. You can buy chunks of birch logs um, in garden centers or places where they uh, have florist stuff. Um, there's also a nice little lantern in there and that cute little bird. The bird is not real, I can almost guarantee you, but makes a nice accent for that container. And by the way, all those evergreens that are in there, um, it's very possible, and I, I just found this picture online, I think I've attributed it somewhere there, um, but you can just take cuttings from evergreens at your house um, and just stab those into the soil where you have, where you had your um, annuals. So say your petunias are starting to look really bad, um, you've got something else in there that just is done you can go ahead and take those out and then put the evergreens in there. Now, some people use like a florist foam in there, but if you keep your soil in there, um, you could just use those things and, and those um, logs and the, the birch logs and things like that will just stab right into the soil and uh, you won't have to buy the, um, the florist foam. I matter of fact, it would never have crossed my mind to do that until I heard that somebody did, did it that way because the soil works perfectly. Um, I'm including this picture to show you this. This was taken in downtown Chicago one year and see the little boxwoods in there. Uh, pansies are very, very cold loving plants. And you'll see those in the garden centers as early as maybe March, but definitely April, depending on weather. It always depends on the weather. And, um, and then they will stop blooming kind of in the middle of summer sometimes when it gets really, really hot, they, they just don't bloom well then. And then they'll pick up again in the fall. Um, so you can, if you want, take those out. Now see what I mentioned this, this was taken in downtown Chicago and a lot of commercial places have no problems with just taking those plants out, throwing them away. They might be doing that with the boxwoods as well because in that window box, I don't think the boxwoods are going to live from year to year. And I don't think that's even their intention. Boxwood is not native to our area. And as much as maybe I wanna say 25 or 30 years ago, um, you did not see a boxwood in our area. It was only, I remember when, they, when I first started seeing them and it's been, cause I've lived in my house 30 years. So yeah, about back then, um, you started seeing the first boxwoods that were um, hardy in the Chicago area. Um, before then, I mean, I never grew up with a boxwood in my neighborhood anywhere. And so because of the fact that they're just marginally hardy here or they're hardy here now, if you get the right varieties, by the way, there's a variegated boxwood, not hardy in our area, just saying. But um, something like this might be hardy to zone five, but again, in a small area like that, in a, a window box that looks like it's maybe a foot or foot and a half wide, that boxwood is not gonna make it, but but in a commercial use, they have no problem taking it out, throwing it away. And same thing with tulip bulbs and all that, they do the same thing. So again, what about evergreens? It depends. You can take those things, you could take branches of them and shove them in for fall interest or even through Christmas time. Um, if you have a big enough container and a weatherproof pot, you could keep those there for a long, long time. Um, but if we have a really, really rough winter, you're taking a chance and those things might not um, come back. See the word euonymus right here with the little question mark in there. Euonymus is no longer sold in the state of Indiana. Um, I wonder if I have that in this picture. I'll show you one later. I think I'm going to have a picture of euonymus. Uh, it has been a very popular landscaping shrub, but no longer able to be sold in the state of Anna, Indiana because it is invasive. Sometimes you'll still see it in containers, um, hanging baskets. I saw just the other day at work, you'll still see Euonymus as a little trailer um, in containers. I don't know if they're supposed to be doing it that way, but. So here's just a bunch of ideas. The white birch logs just sticking out there like that. And by the way, some of these pictures don't necessarily have things that are available in our area. So I'm just showcasing the, the, the things that are on this list, okay? That almost looks like a peony or something over there. So, uh, and the forsythia in bloom at the same time. So yeah, just, just a thought. And again, no, no um, shame in adding some artificial um, accents here and there, but, but I beg of you, make sure they look real. <laughs> I, of course, as a, if, you're, if you've been a gardener for a long time, you could spot a fake from, a long, from a, quite a distance away. Um, 
but if they can fool if they can fool you, you're doing good. Uh, red twig dogwood. I always say, why didn't I plant a red twig dogwood 20 years ago, or yellow twig dogwood? And um, so yeah, you could just cut off those branches and stab them in, and they make nice interest there. There's a yellow twig dogwood. Um, a curly. It could be a curly. Now that I'm looking at it, it's very curly. And again, just branches cut from trees. Uh, this is Carl Forrester uh, feather reed grass. And um, it's got those nice seed heads on there. Again, um, let's see, what did I write down what that is? I don't remember if I wrote down what that is in my notes or not. You, you will have a um, access to the notes and the recording. Um, but yes, accents of, uh, I don't know what that is now. And uh, there's the winterberry and some more flowering kale. Winterberry is a deciduous holly. And um, if you have either the deciduous holly, which loses its leaves, or the regular holly, uh, either one um, will have berries in the fall. Some of the viburnums have flower or uh, colorful berries in the fall. There are a lot of plants that do, and you could certainly cut those and put those in your pots. Um, holly is considered a dioecious, dioecious plant, which means if you were to buy a, um, a like a deciduous holly like this, or or a nevergreen holly, just so you could have the berries. Keep in mind that you will only have berries on the females and you have to have a male nearby in order to have berries. Okay. Uh, more birch and evergreens. And I wish you could find a better picture. This is a contorted filbert. Now this picture looks like it was taken in the spring because I see the heather in the corner here. That's heather, that's a spring blooming plant. Pansies, again, for spring, but you'll see them again in the fall. And if you're careful enough and want to take your pansies out of your spring pots and then um, winter them over or not summer them over, and you can put them in your pots again in the fall. I think I'm going to try that this year myself. Um, I'm doing some pots at my church and I'm going to try that this year. See how that goes. I have a tendency, this is being, being truthful here. I have a tendency to forget to water things, even though they're right there by the front door and I've got two jobs and um, I, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. Okay, I'll be honest. Uh, so I'm gonna attempt to take the pansies out and keep them during the summer. I'll probably put them in a shady place um, since they don't really like a, a lot of uh, heat and we'll see what happens. And then Pussy Willow. Pussy Willow, this is a spring container or what we would say late winter container. Uh, when you hear the words late winter, they're usually talking about March, maybe, um, and the pussy willows will start blooming. And then I see hellebores over here and uh, more pansies. And of course, you can always add height. This picture on the right was taken from the Proven Winners. Oh, good point to mention. If you go to the, and then not, they're not a sponsor. I just like Proven Winners. But you can get this um, book sent to you for free, uh, the Gardener's Idea Book. Go to provenwinners.com, get that sent to you for free, and they'll send it to you every year. It has um, ideas for what they call recipes for plant combinations. They'll tell you what's in it. So like these pictures right here, and they'll tell you what's in each one. Um, but like I said, you don't have to buy their plants necessarily, but they do have that nice resource for free. Um, the little uh, cage up here, you can, um, you can use that and plant things like, um, uh, morning glories up there and any plant that vines could be trained to grow up there. I bet you could even do a sweet potato vine that way, even though it wants to hang. If you were to tuck it in, um, you might be able to get it to go up like that. Okay, this is the plant container that my friend Robin and I planted at our church. Now we did this for Easter. It doesn't look like much because Easter was very early this year. And literally, we could not find um, even Lysimachia, the Creeping Jenny, which I would have loved to have had hanging off on the edge just for the lime green contrast. Um, so we planted, I bought some color bowls, they're called. They were like 12, 15 inch bowls, shallow bowls that had the combination of pansies in there as well as Dusty Miller, which likes cool weather as well. You'll see plants in the spring and garden centers. If they like cool weather, you'll start seeing them real early. Uh, Snapdragons is another one that, well, that likes cool, um, cool weather. So anyway, it, it didn't fill out a whole lot. Like I said, it was first early, but Robin had some branches in her yard. Those are just plain old branches. We didn't spray paint them, nothing. 
just plain branches. Again, if we had had more time and maybe if I had something in my yard uh, that I had planted 20 years ago, we might have had something a little bit back better. So here's what I'm planning. Now, I spent a lot of time on this, okay, folks? This here, I did this in Photoshop, see? I hope you're impressed. Okay, so here's the current one. Uh, just the other day, I planted some uh, sweet potato vine on the corner, okay? So it looks roughly like this, not really, because the sweet potato vine has not grown yet, but you get the idea. And then later, my intention is to take out the pansies, like I was telling you, and put in this uh, bubblegum um, super tunias that I just bought, and also the uh, unplugged blue salvia. Um, like I said, salvia, so easy to grow. You don't have to worry about deadheading. Same thing with the super petunias. You don't have to worry about them. The super, super petunias and also the wave petunia do not have to be deadheaded in order to keep them blooming. You can give them a haircut once in a while. If that is getting way too long and hanging on the ground, you could give them a haircut. Or if it looks like they're starting to get a little straggly, give, give the whole plant a haircut. I try to do like every other branch so or, or just in random places so you're not really like, yeah, so it doesn't look like I've given myself a Dutch boy haircut. Um, and then, okay, this is what I hope it will look like in another couple of weeks because I'm gonna go plant the, um, the salvia and this bubble gum soon. And then in the fall, if I would like to, if I don't change my mind, I could take out the, uh, the mums, we're talking about when it gets too cold for the sweet potato vine. If I had wanted to, if I thought about it, I could have gotten the Lysimachia, which would handle the, the colder weather, but I've already bought the sweet potato vine. I like it. And, um, and just put a mum in there. Mums, a couple of mums. Um, with, with the blue, yellow would look nice. The re red wood, orange wood. So it just, we'll just see. We'll just see what happens. And then maybe leave the mums in, take the salvias out. This is the dynamic part of, of uh, container routing. Do you like my little pine cones that I cut and pasted over there? And might or might not need to take out those branches. They're still there because I don't know how to erase them in the Photoshopping thing, but um, they could stay there and then add pine cones, depending on if there's lots of pine cones or if we don't have any or whatever we wanna do. Maybe some put some birch logs in there at the time. And then for Christmas, we could just put some, um, you know, again, commercial landscape. I don't know if there will be budget for putting in some small arborvitas or maybe little Christmas trees in there. Um, if it's a location where you wanted to, you could add some lights, um, add some bows, but you get the idea, right? move things around, swap things in and out. Uh, let's plan ahead for summer or spring now too. Just like with the shrubs I mentioned, um, it depends on winter and depends on um, how much insulation you have in a pot. So you could put tulip bulbs, hyacinth bulbs, and things like that in containers, uh, as long as the container is weatherproof and winterproof. And um, just like the drawing shows, you're going to put the bigger bulbs in the bottom and kind of layer them. You could find um, descriptions, recipes, directions online if you want more detail on that. Um, but uh, again, you'd have to water occasionally just as if it was snowing out there and, um, and plant them close together. The smaller bulbs get planted a little more shallowly than the bigger bulbs. The other thing though, when it comes to uh, bulbs, and this applies also if you have them in the ground, is that sometimes critters like to get them. So you'd have to put maybe a repellent on. I have a pot right outside my doorway that I'm starting some Swiss chard in for, um, for fall planting. I'm just, I'm just trying things out, right? Cause we're talking about it here. And so I've got Swiss, Swiss chard started and uh, something else in the middle of the pot. I've just, it's just like an experimental pot. And I'm already seeing things that looks like, I don't know if the squirrels are jumping from onto the pot, using it as a launching spot to get onto my porch. I don't know what, but I see holes in there every now and then. Um, but there's nothing in there that, that I don't want them to eat, so I don't care. And um, so, yeah, there are repellents you can get for critters, or you can cover it with some kind of uh, hard, hardware cloth or something, as long as you uh, remove it later or have the holes big enough so the plants can grow through. Okay, some more winter pots just for looks here. 
I see holly in there. And a lot of garden centers, and like I said, places where you could buy floral decor will have accents if you don't have those growing in your yard. You can buy that kind of stuff. Uh, more, and again, birch, barks are just, birch bark logs are beautiful. Uh, there's even some Christmas decor in there. Those are um, seed pods. Oh, gosh. I don't know what those seed pods are. There's something that doesn't grow around here, though. Eucalyptus? I don't know. Um, and then for next spring, think about the grasses. If you've kept them in your pot, fine. Otherwise, um, you could cut those. A lot of people uh, like to leave ornamental grasses up in the landscaping because they have that beautiful fall interest and all winter interest, which is uh, what I would recommend to. Um, but then in the spring, it's time to cut those down and you could certainly just whack them and put those in your pots in the spring. Pansies will be in the garden centers again then. Uh, ornamental kale and ornamental cabbage, not so much, but if you want those, you can certainly um, order those um, already started. Some places will probably have those for sale or start those indoors because you're going to be getting antsy during the winter to grow things anyway, right? And then the Creeping Jenny, maybe we'll just make it through the winter and you won't have to worry about it. Dusty Millers, Snapdragons, um, Hellebores are a perennial, um, but those will be for sale in the spring. A lot of times you'll see things available in garden centers when they are in bloom um, because that's when people are looking for them. And uh, you'll be able to find things when you go shopping in the spring. Um, just get you in the garden center, right? Okay. Oh, here's the euonymus I was mentioning. If you didn't recognize the name, you probably recognize that plant, that filler in the middle with the bright yellow and green foliage. That's uh, euonymus emerald and gold. There's also one called emerald gaiety. And then there are several others. Emerald gaiety has green and white leaves. You will no longer be able to find that shrub in a garden center. But... If you have had one, um, I almost didn't put that in the pot, in the picture in there, but it was a good point, a good chance to mention to you about invasive shrubs that are no longer available for sale. This dogwood, and dogwoods are uh, hardy to, to a, um, a higher zone, but that is also a very big pot. So if you had a dogwood in that pot and you were keeping it all winter, it would be getting ready to um, to leaf out in the spring. And then there's also pansies in that container, but that is a very big container. Um, here's pansies again, and a juniper, uh, more Lysimachia, Creeping Jenny, really, like I said, really hardy plant. Um, and uh, if it if it starts to look straggly over winter and you were and if, and if it was able to, you were able to keep it over winter in a pot you could certainly give it a haircut and uh, get it going again and fill out more uh, there's new guinea impatience over there too okay so i said we would talk about veggies and everything i said about planting flowers uh, in containers would apply to veggies too um, you can transition from early spring things uh, like the greens, a lot of the greens and the brassicas like the cooler weather. So you could certainly do Swiss chard in early season, and then you could start again in the fall. You could mix flowers together. You can mix like this. This is the Swiss chard that I have going right now. I think it's called Rainbow Light or Rainbow Bright or something like that. Uh, but there's several that have really colorful um, stalks like that. And that's what I've got started in my pot. This is not my pot, by the way. Uh, but you can see they've got that combined with, uh, there's looks like some rosemary in there and uh, ornamental peppers. Uh, peppers like hot weather though. So um, I, I mean, I see those in the fall. So I don't know what's up with those peppers. I have not grown those. If anybody else has experience on that, I'd love to hear it later. Um, but just the idea of combining your veggies and your flowers together, especially with the idea of companion planting, since there are a lot of flowers that repel pests. And I just think it looks pretty that way. So yeah, the same principles apply with um, the soil. Make sure you fertilize more often because you're leaching out the fertilizer that's in the soil. Um, make sure you have drainage at the bottom so your plants don't uh, die from overwatering. Um, make sure you get a big enough pot. Now this is a tomato plant. I have grown a lot of veggies in containers. I have a lot of shade at my house and I, it's just me and my daughter living here. So we don't have a need for a lot of veggies, but I have grown uh, tomatoes um, at, right by the front door. And yes, I have to remind myself to water them, even though they're right by the front door when I come home. And, um, but you want to make sure you have enough of a root system for them. 
Um, some, some plants, some tomato plants are better for container gardening than others. If it is a determinate tomato, that means it will grow to a determined size. And usually those are the bush tomatoes. Uh, but some, some of the some determinate tomatoes usually bear fruit all at one time. If you get an indeterminate tomato plant, it will bear fruit for an indeterminate length of time all season long um, until frost gets it. Um, but you will also have, um, you'll have fruit all season long and you will also have a bigger plant, in which case maybe that would be a good point to use that a trellis or something like that in the middle of your pot. The same principles apply. Oh, and this is, this is just for fun. You can plant in anything. That, that little tiny seashell in the middle, that's my, my planting. I, I did that one. And the little John Deere tractor in the lower left corner, I just stabbed some, um, some sphagnum moss in there, get it really good and wet, and then put some uh, succulent cuttings in there. The little moss garden on the right, I like moss. And there's little cuttings of plants in there. Uh, the top left and the top right are pictures I found online. And I do not have credits for those. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't, it's been so long ago that I don't know where I got them from. Uh, but I love that uh, the succulent. Succulents will grow very easily in almost anything. Some of my favorite websites. Proven Winners is always a good one for uh, gardening in, in your yard, vegetable gardening, flower gardening, but also for container gardening. Um, Garden Answer is the, um, the website for uh, that sponsors, let's see, Garden Answer is sponsored by Proven Winners. And M.I. Gardner, who is a master gardener from the state of Michigan. Um, and, and then also, if you're interested in succulent gardens, the Succulent Perch is a good uh, Facebook page. Um, I don't see them publish or posting a lot, so I don't know if they're still active, but they, this picture came from the Succulent Perch and has a lot of nice, uh, nice arrangements there. Uh, one last thing, Master Gardener Hotline. So if you have any questions about things, you can contact that number and somebody will be able to answer your questions. Master Gardeners also have a Facebook page, Lake County Master Gardeners. So I would be happy to open it up to uh, questions. Okay, Lynn, our first question is two parts. First, what are some of the common problems you see people run into when they are just getting into container gardening? And second, what are some solutions to those problems? I think the first thing um, is that they're buying garden soil. Although I had a customer saying the other day that she, she's used garden soil all the time. She, she thinks potting soil dries out too fast, um, but that's it. But the biggest thing probably is not watering. They, they, they just let it dry out. Um, not deadheading flowers that need it. Um, that's probably about it. Cause so many of the plants out there uh, are very easy to grow, very easy to grow. Um, and the, the, like the super tunias, calibricoas, I don't know what else. If you had specifics, specific plants you'd like, I'll tell you if they're easy or not. Um, but like I said, I'm also guilty of forgetting to water stuff. And that's probably the worst. And I mentioned that if you do that, you can let it sit like in 15 or 20 minutes in water to get it wet again. Lynn, what are some plants that repel insects? Marigolds are the first thing that come to mind. Um, I don't know, uh, and actually I don't know, I've not really done much with companion planting. I like putting uh, flowers in there. Miracles is all I can remember though. One of our participants is interested in planting marigolds in her garden with garden soil. And she's wanting to know if that is the best soil for those marigolds to thrive. Yes, if you're planting them in the ground, definitely garden soil. Um, there are, and I, I, again, I apologize. I'm more familiar with miracle Grow stuff because that's what we sell where I work. Um, but th they have a, a soil label for flowers in the ground. But any good garden soil would do. If you have decent soil to begin with, you could probably do well just planted in that. I mean, for several years, that's all I did. I never bought anything else. We had nice black dirt work at my house. Um, but if you want to, you could always add things like... Um, Again, this is all stuff that's available for sale anywhere you go. Things like um, organic compost, organic, uh, the, oh, there's mushroom compost, which is the soil mushrooms was grown on, mushrooms were grown on, there's no mushrooms in there. Um, 
anything that's labeled as a soil amendment, uh, compost, cow manure, that kind of thing. You could add to that. Um, or if you wanted to buy, you know, ready mixed garden soil, you can do that. Lynn, a participant has a question about drainage holes. She states, I feel like it's common for some containers to have no drainage holes. Is it best to just avoid those or is there a way around that? I can't speak for all containers, but a lot of the ones that I see will have a little circle embossed on the bottom and it will say a drill hole for drainage. Um, if you're planting it outside, I would definitely say I'll put some kind of drainage in there, um, either drill holes in there or put rocks at the bottom. But even still, if you do rocks at the bottom and we get a heavy rain, there will be no place for that to go. Several years ago, I worked in an apartment complex and I planted a big, it was a big whiskey barrel right by the front door. And I had stuff in there that should have handled uh, like I think there was um, maybe a put lavender, lavender in there or salvia, something that didn't need a lot of water. And I could not figure out why those things were dying. And when I went to take them out of the pot, it was all mucky. And that's when I realized it was, um, it, the, there, were, there was drainage holes in the bottom of the pot, but because there was a little lip on the bottom, the water was not able to get out. And to top it all off, it was right underneath the gutter uh, where the gutter was dripping. <laughs> So yes, you definitely have to, because otherwise there's just no place. And if it get, gets a lot of rain, the water will just sit there and accumulate. By the way, that really nice pot that I showed you, uh, I planted what, we're, that we are in the process of redoing and doing again at my church, this one in the top middle, that, that comes in several sizes and it's advertised as a self-watering pot. And there's like two sections. There's a place right here near the bottom um, that you could fill water. I actually went to their website and had trouble figuring out what exactly they wanted us to do with it. There was also a area right in here about a foot high, which made a lot of sense. That's all we needed was the soil about a foot, 15 inches or so at the top. And what we wound up doing was filling the bottom because this isn't a fairly um, open location and these planters are kind of tall. That's about 18 inches across, the ones we got. So um, we, want, we wanted them to be bottom heavy for stability. So we put bricks in the bottom and then up in this area was kind of empty. And then we just put the soil at the top. The intention with it from what I looked at their website is that you would fill this bottom part here with water. But again, with it being outside, um, the last thing I wanted to do is come to church one Sunday morning and discover, you know, there's just a ton of water in there and then have to tip it all out and have plants be floating around in there. I, I don't know what to expect if that were the case. So we wound up taking the hole out and there or the plug out. I'm kind of wondering if the self watering is intended just for use indoors. Uh, like I said, I went to their website, never could get a, quite a good answer for that. So we just decided to take the plug out. There was a plug in the bottom, so they had the option of doing both. Okay, looks like we have a few other questions. Okay. There's a participant that has planted ornamental cabbage in their front yard, and it's not looking good. And they're wondering what they can do to perk it up, and it's planted in full sun. I'm wondering if it's just too late for ornamental cabbage. Cabbage likes cool weather. Was that sold as an ornamental cabbage? She has, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting to me because this time of year, I wouldn't think it'd be right for ornamental cabbage. That's considered a cool cool season plant. And like I said, the color gets better as the, as the weather is cooler. Okay, we have another question. How do you address moles in the garden? Um, if, it, if it is a mole, you'll recognize the, the tunnels in your yard and you can treat, uh, there, are, there are all kinds of things you can use, repellents and smoke bombs and things like that, that you have to follow the directions on and put them in the active tunnels. It could be just a vole if you're just seeing holes though. And those you could probably buy a repellent or something in there. Some of those repellents though, you have to repeat and swap out occasionally. I've heard that, that um, uh, animals get immune to those things. 
like I've heard about, you know, leaving out a bar of soap so that they think there's people there. But if they're living in an environment where you're in the backyard all the time, they're used to your the, the scent of people. And so that might not work as well. It doesn't look like there are any more questions. I think we can go ahead and wrap up. And so I just want to thank everyone for joining us for today's session. And especially a big thank you to Lynn for sharing her knowledge and expertise with us. We very much appreciate having you with us today. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. I love talking about this kind of thing. <laughs>